Well, good morning, everybody. Hello. Thanks for uh, joining us. We're going to just do a little conversation, Key and I are, for uh, those of We're you who are tuning out. in online. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to get online. Grab and some I'm coffee. See who's with us. Yeah. See who's. See who's uh, tuning in today. Who you are you doing the online campus? I'll go to Facebook. Okay. Which is funny because I don't really go to Facebook. So. Yeah. So we'll see who's uh, jumping on. Welcome if you're in the room yeah. and if you're out in the atrium. Uh, grab your own coffee because we're not serving coffee right now, <laughs> and make your way in here. Uh, if you're online, you know, get some coffee. If you maybe your third cup by now, it's like 11 o'clock. I'm probably thinking about lunch or brunch maybe. If it's if it, you're still drinking coffee at 11, man, I'd be like. Oh. I I do. I drink coffee till. Do you? Yeah, I do. Oh, I can't do it because I start drinking coffee at 5:30 in the morning. Well, me too, but. Like, I have this ritual now that at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I go down and fix myself a latte. we got a new little, like, espresso machine. Ooh, tell me about this, because I've been hearing oh. about all these people who, like, have gotten into espresso machines and stuff during COVID. I'm just not that fancy, let's be honest. It's, I love that frothy milk stuff. Mm. Oh, man. And this, this machine really, really <laughs> makes good frothy milk. Okay. Or half and That's half. Fair. I use half and half. That is fair. Because I'm not too concerned about the fat content, so I, I like. And then <laughs> well, I text good. a picture. My daughter works in Denver. Uh -huh. And every afternoon when I make one, because she likes me to make them for her, but she's sure. in Denver. Okay. So the other day I fixed I fixed a latte, and I drank it all, and yeah. I sent her a picture of the like the little foam at the bottom of the cup that was all left over. Oh, pretty. And she, I said, this was yours, but I drank it. And she texted me back two little hog noses, you know, mm -hmm. emojis. Mm -hmm. It's kind of fun. So you like having your own espresso machine? That's, oh, okay. it's, it's great. That's good. Yep. So, Kia. So, Dennis. Happy what do you Sunday. want to talk about? What do you want me to ask you? Do you want me to ask you about uh, you, you Bob? Ask, you know what? Ask Bob me about something new. Or, or ask music. Me about something new. Something new. Something new. Uh, we actually me. did this one. What's an award you've gotten? And Okay. Okay, that's We fair. did this Thursday night, but we, we didn't did, do it we today. We didn't do this today. What's an award? Well, I... I got the writing award my senior year of high school. It was like, Whoa. you know, senior class awards or whatever. Yeah. Writing You award. guys are in the presence of greatness. Yeah. Like, yeah. was it like a Pulitzer or a? Obviously, yes. She, she got No. <laughs> it was, I don't know. They, my English teacher liked the way I wrote what, what was it, my papers. What did you write? What was it? I don't, I don't know. I mean, don't it wasn't remember. like I submitted anything. I had no idea that I was, was going to get essay? the award. Was it an essay? Was it a no, it poem? Wasn't, I think it was like over the course of the year, oh, my body of work. accumulation. Yeah, my body of work constituted wow. the receiving of the writing what award. What did you get? Like, was it? <laughs> I got a little, like, Oscar statue. A trophy. It's, like, that big, and it says... Desert Vista High School. Do you still have it? Writing award. I think it's in a box. So it was that important to like well, save? Well, yeah, kind of. I don't know. It was. It was more funny. I because I didn't know it was coming. Yeah. Tell me about an award that you've received. Well, I have. I have two trophies I've is, kept I from college good. and high school. Mm -hmm. uh, one trophy has four animals on it because I got the. It's called Round Robin Showman mm -hmm. or Showwoman at the at the fa at a fair. Mm -hmm. And that was fun. And then the other word that uh, that I'm kind of the most proud of is, is I was on a poultry judging team, for the University of Wyoming when I was in college, and they poultry have the national contest. Judging. Poultry judging. Did you know that poultry And we went to the thing. national contest, and our team got second place in the whole country poultry judging. So okay, here's my question: and How do you like? Poultry judging seems to me like a thing that like. You're a good piece of poultry, and you're not a good piece well, of poultry. Well, you judge. So how is, it that, judge, how is it that you get judged by your judging? Does that make sense? They set up different, like, like you have to uh, you have to figure out if eggs are double A, A, B, or C. Oh, so it's B, like a secret or C, surprise, and you and have then to you have to go in and decide. And the judges have already decided what uh, they all are. It's like a scorecard. Obviously, I was not a 4-H You member. have to judge turkeys. You have to judge live chickens. You okay. have to judge. Uh, uh, broken out eggs, eggs in the shell, the whole thing. I mean, it's it's quite the thing. I did not um, know And I got thing. fourth high individual in the nation. In the nation? So I'm the Ooh. fourth high, Presence at least for about again. 20 minutes. Fourth best poultry judger on the... Do you the, stand by your ability to judge poultry I could teach you to a thing this or day? Two. I could. Like, I'll bet you didn't know the difference between a double A egg and an A egg. 
I when you buy them in the store. I do not know. I kn- I I know yeah, the see? brand that I like to buy. See, I could. It's it has it to do with freshness. Double A is fresher than an A. Double A is fresh. And it all has to do with the size of the air cell in the in, into the egg. That's what you have to see. This is a this whole is new world, Dennis. Would, like, this is, let's move on. <laughs> let's not talk about poultry <laughs> judging anymore. Let's move on. People are maybe People not are interested. Like hey, we got snoring. something out in the atrium going on we as do. part of our there Lenten series. There is something series. new and exciting out in the atrium. Why don't you tell us about it, Dennis? You know, uh, this week, as we've been in, this is week two of our Lent series. We started it on Ash Wednesday. And uh, every week we're bringing... Uh, new ideas to this whole Lenten journey. And if you haven't signed up for it yet, please do, because it's fantastic. Yep. And if you don't have the Lent devotional, you can access it online, mm-hmm. um, or uh, we'll send you one. If you didn't or get one and you want one. pick one up out in the atrium. Yeah, if you're in the people building. People in the room. You can, you can pick one up. And then this really week great. we have the prayer wall mm-hmm. out there. And uh, it's a place to record prayer requests. Yep. We're going to talk more we'll about talk it We'll talk more about it. Service. We'll see you guys in a couple more minutes. Well, welcome to Crossroads. Great to see you here this morning. If you're watching online, we can't see you, but we know that you're uh, we're glad that you're with us. We're glad you're joining in. And if you are in the room, I'm just going to invite you to stand. We're going to start by singing together. So if you know this song, sing along with us.
All right, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. All right. Nice. Thanks, Josh. Welcome, everybody. Glad you're in the room. Hey, if you're in the room, turn around and wave at people. All right? Just go, hey, good morning. Glad you're here. I know we can't shake hands and all that business, but we can at least be friendly. And if you're joining us online, wave at us. See them? Oh, yeah. Totally. Look at, look yes. at all those people watching us online. Hello. I was uh, seeing uh, how, how many people there are. And this place is this pace is hopping. These people are alive out here. I mean, this is awesome. Welcome. Living Glad that you're joining us. It's an unbelievable, beautiful Colorado day. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're watching on our online campus or Facebook or YouTube, glad you're here. I'm Dennis. Yes, and I'm Kia. It's great to be here with you this morning. I want to tell you about this little thing we call the Connect Card. So if you're in the room, you have a paper Connect Card in your hand. If you are online, go to crossroadscolorado.com slash gather. Open up your digital Connect card. Did you know this is the best way for you to keep in touch for, with us and for us to keep in touch with you? So whether you are new here or if you've been coming here for years, please use this Connect card because we have some things on this Connect card that we want to tell you about. Big news, Dennis. Yes, big. Yes. We are so excited that next week we are opening up our Crossroads Kids groups. Whoa. Yeah, we're expanding this program. So for babies, birth through fifth grade starting next week you can register your child birth through fifth grade to participate in the crossroads kids group so th this is really great so to to register your child to register your family go to crossroadscolorado.com slash ck kids or check the box on your handy dandy connect card and registration pre-registration is required so uh, snag a spot there's limited spots available especially for those younger kids but we want to be able to um, have those programs available during our Sunday morning service. And your kids are coming, right? Um, yes, they are. Yeah, they are. You School's opening. We're we're extending our kids' ministry. It's very. It's a good day, isn't it? It's a good day for that yep. to be able to we're happen. Excited. And uh, while uh, while you're part of our important part an important part of our life together uh, is generosity. There's something about a person with a generous spirit, and I've noticed people who are generous. They're generous with everything their time, their talent, their treasure. And so every every week at, as a part of our life together, we give people an opportunity to give some of their treasure at this part of the service. And thank you to everybody who participates this in this part, because we, we honestly, we could not do what it is that we're doing without people's generosity and their and your finances. So thank you for participating. There's a lot of ways to give. You can give online. You can set up automate, automated giving. You can text the word crossroads to 77977. It's there on the screen and uh, on the screen as you're looking. And, or uh, Venmo now. Yeah, just search the email address Venmo at crossroadscolorado.com and that'll get you straight to us. And uh, then if you're in the room also, there's a giving envelope that you picked up with your program. You can drop that in the orange kiosks on your way out there in the atrium as well. Or you can, if you're at home, uh, you, we've probably mailed you some envelopes and you can give that way as well. But thank you, really thank you for your generosity. And uh, once a month, uh, we're going to give you a Peace is Worth It update. Peace is Worth It is a ministry initiative that we started around Christmas time that we've been following up on where people have pledged. People said, you know, I'm going to commit this amount of time, this amount of talent, this amount of treasure to, to fulfilling our, really it's a 10-year vision that we've been, we've been laying out. And it's very exciting. And thank you to everybody who's participated. I just want to give you a little update uh, in terms of time. And uh, what we mean by investing time is when you take some of your time and grow your own soul. You invest in your own spiritual growth. And so people have communicated, I'm, you know, I'm going to attend the, the weekend service or I'm going to uh, do the Lenten series where people are investing their time in their own personal growth. And at this point, as of January 1st, 7,500 hours have been invested in people's own personal growth. So way to go. And if you're at home, you can clap for yourselves yeah, as well this because is this guys. is part of that here. Kind, of, kind of pledge. And then uh, talent, not only have people committed time, but talent. And when we say talent, what we're meaning is, how are you using the skills and gifts that you have to serve in another way, to serve here at Crossroads, to serve in the community? So things like Valfest that we did a couple weeks ago, uh, things like helping in the kids area or being on the hospitality team on the weekends or uh, leading a small group during the week. Those are all investments of talent. 
and or some there's some projects too which i'll mention one in just a minute that's part of the talent and up to this point people have given 2,000 hours of talent so far in uh in the 2021 so give yourselves a hand on that one that's pretty awesome yeah and then treasure uh, we set a goal that people would give over and above their normal giving two hundred fifty thousand dollars in this year 2021 and as of now, February into February, people have given $167,000 toward that goal already. Two thirds of the way two -thirds to the, of the goal. Way in two months. In two months. That is something to celebrate. So That's fantastic. thank you. Thank you. You know, really thank you to everybody who's made a pledge. And as a, just a little illustration of what, what someone has done to invest their talent and their treasure is Karen Bentrot came and said, you know what, I have this, I have this concern for the homeless in our community. They're cold could we do a blanket project? And so she's using her sewing machine, that's her talent. She's invested some of her own money, that's her treasure, in giving to this blanket project. And we've invited you all through our Orange Dots page to participate in that. And as of this point, there I think there's like 102 blankets have either been made or donated to homeless people in our community as a part of this committing to time, talent, and treasure. We have invited people to commit their time, talent, and treasure. And if you have not yet made that pledge, we invite you to do that as well. So guess what? Connect card time. You can check the box on your Connect card, and we'll send you a link that'll help you consider how you might also pledge your time, your talent, your treasure to our Pieces Worth It emphasis throughout 2021 and, and beyond. This really is our 10-year our vision for what it means to walk as peacemakers in the world. And so with that, we're going to turn it over to Katie Martinez is as we continue in our worship experience this morning. Thanks, Kia and Dennis. And hi, everyone, here in the Taft facility. And if you're joining us across the miles, it's good to be together this weekend. And we're in this series. Uh, it's called Again and Again. This is week two of that series. And in our gathering this weekend, we will be reminded that again and again, we're called to listen. We're called to more as people of faith, more than prayer, more than singing worship songs, more than talking about our faith or learning about our faith. We're called again and again to listen. And I'll be the first to admit that listening is hard from the time we're toddlers. We start struggling with listening, especially if we don't know what we're listening for or if we just don't like what we're hearing. So for just a moment, as we gather together and enter into worship, I want to lead us in what I'm going to call a kinesthetic call to worship. Kinesthetic, it means becoming bodily involved in whatever you're doing, whether, you know, whether it's learning or it's praying. We can do that kinesthetically by embodying or, or becoming involved with that with our with our bodies. And so I will lead us through this. I'll prompt us through it. Uh, we'll pray together. We're really going to be praying and listening. So let's pray and listen. I would invite everyone to close your eyes. If you're comfortable doing that, you could close your eyes uh, so that you can focus. Uh, put your feet on the ground in front of you if you're able to do that. And maybe just be mindful and pay attention to what the floor feels like beneath your feet. And then release any tension that you might be holding. And you could begin by just focusing on your jaw. Perhaps you hold tension in your jaw. Just be mindful of your jaw. Feel it. And intentionally relax your jaw. And then move to your neck and your throat. What does it feel like? And relax it on purpose. And then pay attention to your shoulders and what your shoulders feel like. And lead your shoulders to relax. And then be mindful of your hands. And as you focus on your hands, you might even notice that you can feel the warmth of your hands. And then focus on your legs. And your knees. And all the way down your legs to your ankles and to your feet. And then allow your feet to relax. Let the tension in your feet just melt out. And then take a deep breath. And slowly let it out. And pay attention to let all of that good air out. 
The Hebrew word for breath is ruach. It's the same word for spirit. And as you breathe, imagine that it's God who's filling up your lungs with energy and love. And trust that God is as near to you as your very breath. And now I invite you to still your mind. Imagine your mind is a river. And thoughts may come into your mind as they always do. And as they come into view floating along the river, just allow them to pass on by and move on downstream instead of paying attention to them or engaging with them. Let the thoughts pass on by and listen. Listen deep. Listen far. Listen wide. And listen. The sound of your breath is the sound of the divine. This is holy space. Your body is a holy space. You are holy. And now I invite you to take another deep breath and let that out. And when you're ready, become aware of your surroundings again. Open your eyes when you're ready. No hurry. And we'll enjoy these next moments of music together. stand again. We're going to sing a couple of songs together. Why don't you sing with us? the 
often the first step to change is listening. We have to listen to those we've hurt. We have to listen to creation as she cries. We have to listen to the voice of the oppressed if we ever hope to make things right. So today, as we begin our prayer of confession, we will start with a moment of silence, a moment to listen. And then we will pray together, trusting that God is always listening to us and that God's ears listen with love. In the book of James in the New Testament, there's an explanation for how confession is healing for our souls. And we come here once every seven days, if we're lucky, right? And we're carrying things. They come, they're, they're a part of our workaday life. They're a part of who we are. And some of them are burdens. Some of them are hard thoughts to carry in our minds. Um, there's a lot. So these moments of confession, just admitting that that's there and allowing God to do that healing is a powerful thing to do. So I'll give you a few moments in silence that you could release uh, burdens that you may be carrying, that you could confess what is burdening you in the quiet of your own heart. And then we'll pray aloud together a, a unifying prayer of confession. And the words will be on the screen if you want to voice that out loud with me. That's also part of it. But I'll give us a moment to be silent and then I'll break the silence and lead us into the prayer. Let's pray. Pray aloud with me. Listening God, take what is closed in me and open it. Take what is distracted in us and settle it. Take what is hurting in us and hold it. Take any and all parts of us that create distance from you, for we are like Peter, O oh God. We argue what we don't know. We fear what we cannot see. And we almost always speak sooner than we listen. So open us, settle us, hold us. We long to hear you more clearly. We long to know you more fully. With hope we pray and with gratitude we confess. Amen. All right, good morning. Welcome to everybody in the room, tuning in online. If you're out in the atrium, thank you for being here. Thank you for connecting. It's great to experience all of you today. I can't see all of you, but I can experience the same uh, presence that we have together. My name is Ryan. If you're a guest this morning, if this is your first time tuning in or coming into the room, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads, which means I get to work with an amazing group of volunteers and a team to hopefully create the space where we experience hope and we bring hope and uh, we become peacemakers people that are committed to the wholeness of this world, to making it a better place. That's kind of the, the big idea in layman's terms. So great to have everybody with us. We're in our series, our Lent series, which Lent is that season leading up to Easter, uh, called Again and Again, Again and Again. And our anchor verse, kind of the, the verse from Scripture that I'm encouraging everybody to memorize, is found in this book in the Old Testament called Lamentations, chapter 3. And it says, The Lord's acts of mercy are not exhausted. Y'all ever had your acts of mercy exhausted as a parent or as a friend? Maybe like, enough! <laughs> if, you have, you've, if you've ever unfriended somebody on Facebook, that's the moment where your acts of mercy are exhausted, right there in that moment. Not that anybody in this room has ever done that. That's right. It says that God's compassion is not spent. 
that his mercies, God's mercies are new each morning. Great is your faithfulness. That every morning, again and again, we're invited into the mercy of God. And this week, we're exploring this idea that God invites us to listen again and again. If you're a talk notes person, a fill in the blank, you can find those online. Or as you came in, you received them with your offering envelope. You can pull those out. And uh, I always say that talk notes give you hope that it will end it will end. Like seven fill-ins, six fill-ins, five, all that good stuff, right? So we're talking about listening again and again, and what is it that we're called to listen to? And that's what I want to explore today a little bit together, whether you're at home uh, tuning in or here in the room, is what are we called to listen to? What are we invited to listen to again and again? How many of you have ever um, heard a voice in your head? You ever heard a voice in your head in a positive way? I mean, you don't have to raise your hand if you're in a negative way, but like that voice in your head. Sometimes these voices come into our head and nobody's around, but we hear their voice. Like maybe it's a friend or a coach or a parent or a spouse, right? And you hear their voice, right? You're getting ready to engage in something and you hear the voice whispering something to you. And, and maybe it's a positive thing, right? Maybe it's a voice from a friend or a coach who just believes in you. Like they're your person, Right? You just know that they're with you, that, that if they ever found out that you killed someone, they would assume you had a good reason and they would help you bury the body. You know, that kind of friend. I'm not suggesting you do that. I'm just using that as an illustration, right? That kind of friend that like, they would just be a positive assumption about the whole situation. Don't even explain it. I just, right. That, and they, maybe they have like this wisdom that they always would say to you, like it, you're in a difficult space, a difficult time, but they would just always give you some wisdom. They, maybe they had a catchphrase that would just help you believe in yourself. So you're getting ready to go into an interview or you're experiencing a difficult circumstance at work or at home and, and you hear that voice kind of in your head encouraging you. Maybe it was a coach always pushing you or a parent telling you that you were loved whole, that you were loved fully no matter what the world tells you or a spouse that's always encouraging to you, right? They're always encouraging you along the way. You hear that voice. We love those voices. We love them. We need more of them in our lives. A voice that we don't like sometimes is maybe those same voices, uh, the same people, or maybe even people we don't know, but it's a voice in our head that is a convicting voice, right? A convicting voice, a voice that calls us to betterness, a voice that says to us, you, you have to kind of take ownership or a convicting voice that kind of keeps the guardrails up in our lives. Maybe there's the convicting voice of a parent when you go to grab the cookie and they said, I told you don't grab them. You hear the voice, they're not around, right? But conviction is this voice, it's this behavior, it's this emotion that we experience that cause us to change. And change is usually difficult. And so we kind of try to ignore that voice as best as we can. We ignore it. We ignore the voice that causes us to question things that we've believed, to question things that are maybe other people's realities, the voices that we hear around us. And the reason why it's, we just, we push them out. We push them out because these voices basically say things like there's no more excuses. You can't make any more excuses for the situation you're in. You've got to start taking some ownership. You got to start looking around you, right? And this, these voices invite us into a really tough space. It's a space where we lament kind of the darkness of this world and we kind of lament our part in it. And because this is such an uncomfortable voice, it's one that we don't want to hear. Oftentimes we just shut it out. We shut it until this voice is screaming bloody murder at us. We feel like everywhere we go, everywhere we turn, we just hear it over and over again. And we can't ignore it anymore. I looked up this phrase, screaming bloody murder. You can actually look it up as an idiom. It's like this just shouting to get someone's attention with such intensity, right? Maybe you've screamed bloody murder at your kids when they started to run and you saw them, they're going into the street, right? So you just start screaming to get their attention. Danger, stop, right? And that's what happens, these convicting voices, because conviction is, a, is something that's good in our lives. Conviction is something that calls us to a better version of ourselves. And that is hopefully something we're all trying to achieve, is a better version of who we are as we grow, as we become more mature, as we become older human beings, as we have more experiences in life. Like it's this desire, okay, I want to become a better version. And I want to talk today about a voice that cries out to us in our world, and we get this beautiful metaphor in the Bible about it, but it's kind of a weird thing where this voice comes from. But what's powerful about it is, uh, is that it's, it's all throughout Scripture, and it's one of the most fundamental kind of metaphors and images within the Christian faith. And I want to talk about the voice of blood, 
I want to talk about the voice of blood. If you've been around church, uh, a Christian church, for any length of time, you've probably heard this expression around the blood of Jesus, or you've heard a lot of talk about sacrifice and blood and animals. And I want to spend a few minutes today, if you'll stick with me, kind of looking at this idea of blood. It's why it's so important in the Christian faith, but I want to look at it from a different perspective. So I want to say right off the bat, so you, in case you're wondering, I kind of hold to a belief, and you probably, if you've been around for a little bit, you've heard me talk about this, that I don't really hold to this. There's lots of different ways that people think about blood in the Bible and the blood of Jesus. So one, I think it's a huge metaphor, and you'll see where I'm getting with that today. But I don't hold to this belief that, that, that we're all so bad that God sent Jesus to shed his blood because the only way that God could forgive us uh, was if someone paid the price for our sins. And if, if Jesus comes and pays and is the perfect kind of lamb of God, that language that we see, then the, we're covered in, in the blood and now we get to go to heaven because God's anger, God's righteousness, God's wrath has been appeased through Jesus. So I'm just gonna say this right off the bat. I don't really believe that. Now, I do believe in the power of the cross. I believe in the power of Jesus' blood, but that's not how I think of it. And because I think as you look in Scripture, what we actually see is God fighting against that mentality. That there is this better way to understand blood if we see kind of like the whole of the picture. And so that might be strange to some of you, but it's not strange. Like within the Christian movement, there's lots of different ways to think about this. But one of the big reasons why I don't think this is true, that this idea that God is so perfect and so uh, righteous and we're such sinners that God could never be in our presence, we could never be in God's presence because of that, it seems to me it falls apart all throughout the scripture because God seems to make these appearances and nobody spontaneously combusts. And Jesus walked around just forgiving sins willy-nilly. Like it was no big deal. Your sins are free. Nobody even asked for it. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are... Like Jesus was around people all the time that we would classify as sinners under that model. And, and they never died in Jesus's presence. They were welcomed into his presence. So I want to look at this idea of blood and maybe give us a framework for seeing it in a healthier way and in a way that doesn't lose its kind of power, the imagery, but cause us into something different. And the place to start is really with this story of Cain and Abel. Um, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that Cain and Abel is kind of the first story of murder or homicide uh, that we see in, this, in the sacred story, in the story of Scripture. And if you're not familiar with it, Cain and Abel are brothers. Uh, they're the only two brothers that we know of in the story right now. And Cain and Abel, they go and they make a sacrifice to God. The God's name is Yahweh. For some strange reason, they make this sacrifice in the text. We don't really know because God never tells them to start sacrificing things or to make offerings. Uh, We don't see that, but there was the assumption of this at the time it was written. And so they're making an offering to God. And in some way, uh, Abel's offering is pleasing to God and Cain's offering is not pleasing to God. And Cain gets embarrassed by this and he gets very angry. And so rather than taking responsibility for whatever it is that's going on in his heart and his life, he sees the problem as his brother Abel. So he goes out in the field, he confronts Abel, and he ends up uh, killing him. And so he leaves. Now, we don't know, like, did, did Cain know that he killed him? Maybe he didn't know. Did he try? Did he premeditate? Who knows? But at the end of the story is Cain has killed Abel. And so Cain's out hanging out doing his thing, and God shows up, and God asks Cain, hey, where's your brother Abel? Which is kind of funny to me. God is in the habit of losing people, right? In the first three or four chapters of Genesis. I mean, he's walking through the garden. He can't find Adam and Eve. It's like, where are my humans at? I've lost them again. Like, there's only four of them, God. Like, what do you mean you've lost another one? <laughs> right? I mean, like, God, I thought you knew everything. But this is such a great image of this, these stories that we get handed down to us, right? God says, where's your brother Abel? I've got an appointment with him. I need to talk to him. And, and Cain, like, this is not the question Cain wants, Right? He's like, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And, and Yahweh, the, the God, says to Cain in this story, what have you done? What have you done? And then he makes this statement, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Your brother's blood cries out. And it's the first time we have the spilled blood of a scapegoat, right? Where this big idea that you take something and you displace your sin or your anger or your frustration, you put it on that thing, and then you take it out on that thing, and that thing this time was Abel. 
It's the first time we see it. And this is a major theme all throughout Scripture, the idea of a scapegoat, where we just, we put all of our sins and all of our problems on someone else, the other. And there's a couple things about this passage that I find fascinating. One is the Hebrew word here for blood is plural. So it actually says quite literally that your brother's bloods cries out to me. Now this sounds strange to us and it could just be a simple grammatical issue, a problem with the text, but lots of commentators throughout the ages have picked up on this issue. And there's a group of writings called the Mishnah, which were put together by the rabbis. And it was when they took the oral law of Judaism uh, and they, they put it in written form. And there's commentary all throughout kind of the, the Torah, the, the five books of Moses. And, and in the Mishnah, they talk about this passage very specifically. It's very fascinating what the rabbi said. The rabbi said, this is why it says bloods, because it was the, the future generations that were lost that were also crying out to God that day. And they said this, it's very powerful. They said, to kill a person is to kill an entire world. And to save a person is to save a world. That there's something about the fabric of the universe when the, the innocent blood, when the blood kind of drips into the earth, that the universe itself knows something is wrong. Something has ended that shouldn't have ended. There's been a world that's been destroyed. And I love the other thing about this is that the, the word crying here is present and active. It's not something that happened in the past. Right, that this blood of Abel, it didn't cry out. It wasn't Abel crying when he was murdered. No, this is, this is after the fact. This is the very earth itself that has soaked up this blood. And it's crying out continually. And this imagery, this idea of blood and sacrifice and killing, like it carries on throughout all the Old Testament, and we could look at it over and over again, but I want to just jump ahead to Jesus because Jesus actually makes a comment about this story, this person, Abel. And it happens in Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus is talking to the religious leaders of his day. Matthew chapter 23, it's kind of like the woe chapter. Jesus is like, woe to you Pharisees and Sadducees, you teachers of the law. You distort the truth and you make it so difficult uh, for people and they can't. And he just lists all these things that have happened and that are taking place to exclude people, right? That are, that are frustrating people trying to draw near to God. And he kind of culminates this section, right? And this is what Jesus says. He says, therefore, because of all these things, behold, I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes. And some of them you will kill and crucify. You'll shed their, their blood too. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And this is where it gets really interesting. Jesus says, so that there may come upon you all the righteous bloodshed upon earth. There's a connective tissue here of all suffering, of all injustice. And he says, from the righteous blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. Right? He says, it, 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 this bookend, right, it, it is what it's saying. And he, and he goes on, he says, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Now, a couple of things about this, right? Jesus, in this statement, equates the behavior of the Sadducees and the Pharisees that would put all these burdens on people, that would keep them away from God's promises and keep them away from God's presence and would exclude them, that that behavior is, is equated with Cain's murderous actions. It's the same. It's the shedding of blood. It's the persecution. And it's this idea that all injustice and violence are connected. That we live in an interconnected universe where there isn't just a person that suffers over there and a violence that takes place over there and a death over here, but all of it seeps into the very earth itself. And it's this chain of suffering. It's this chain of blaming. It's this chain of violence. He makes this, Jesus made this statement about this death of Zechariah. He says, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Where Jesus is, we think that Jesus is referring to this person who's mentioned in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. And, and in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, it's kind of the last um, witness that we have of an unjust murder, a death. Not that there's ever a just murder, that was probably an oxymoron, but that there, this is kind of the, the, the end of it in the sacred history. And so Jesus kind of bookends, right? You have the blood of Abel at the very beginning of the sacred history of our text. And then Chronicles would have been kind of the last book of the Hebrew Bible, if you look at the way it's kind of ordered for, for, for within Judaism. So this is kind of the end of it. In all of it, there is this history of bloodshed. There's a history of violence. There's a history of when you don't like what somebody else says, you do violence and we murder and we kill. 
And then Jesus comes, I believe, and many others do as well, that Jesus comes and enters into that violence to show here's how it stops. (laughs) Here's how it stops. Instead of returning violence for violence, I'm going to return love for violence. And I'm going to shed my blood. And so we have the death And we have Jesus conquering death, hell, and the grave. And we have the imagery of blood being shed to heal us of our wounds. And again, it's this this, this huge image. It carries through. And we have this letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament that talks about these two bloods, the blood of Abel and the blood of Jesus. And so the letter to the Hebrews is written sometime after Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And the letter to the Hebrews, if you're wondering, the big theme of the letter to the Hebrews is Jesus is better. <laughs> That's just the great theme of it. It's like Jesus is better. It starts off with like Jesus is just the, the most glorious one. Image of God like is better. And, and, and it talks about these two bloods in that context. So in Hebrews 11, chapter 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a sacrifice greater than Cain. So the writer of Hebrews making an interpretation as to why Abel's sacrifice was better, right? Why, not even, well, he says greater than Cain's, but why it was pleasing and why Cain's wasn't. He says, through this, he was attested to be righteous, God bearing witness to his gifts. And through this, though dead, he still speaks. And how does he still speak? Through this story of his murder, right? Of his being kind of sacrificed because Cain displaced, right? What he didn't want to hear. But here's here's so powerful. What was this voice speaking? Well, throughout the tradition and history of Abel, we see that his voice was speaking vengeance. Like the blood of Abel was crying out for vengeance. And we see this language quite often over and over again. Crying out for vengeance, there's a, there's a little um, book or, or writing called The Testament of Abraham. And The Testament of Abraham is a Jewish writing, and it was written probably around the same time as uh, Matthew or some of our Gospels uh, were written. It's certainly been influenced by Christian teachings and things like that. But this, it's the story of Abraham dies, and kind of Abraham in his death, he wants to see what happens in the universe with the end of the world and when heaven. And, and, he, and he's kind of given this tour and uh, by, I think it's Michael, the archangel. And, and he's given this tour in this story, and he sees these two lines in heaven. And if you're familiar with Jesus a little bit, you might recognize some of the language. But he sees these big lines, and there's, a, there's two gates. There's a narrow gate, and there's a wide gate. And there's lines going into these. There's a whole bunch of people going through the wide gate, broad gate, and there's a whole bunch of people, there's a fewer people going through the narrow gate. And, she, and he says, oh, I want to go see what's going on. So the angel takes him through the broad gate where all these people are, and there's a man sitting on a throne judging those coming through the broad gate. And some are going left and some are going right. And who the person is on the throne in this letter, this testament of Abraham is Abel. And what this tells us is that there was this imagery, there was this Jewish imagination, this understanding that those human beings who were sacrificed, who were murdered, who experienced injustice, that they would judge men because they deserved vengeance. But here's what Hebrews 12 says. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and the sprinkled blood speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. That there was this understanding of vengeance, and that really is the cycle of violence, to avenge the violence. I'm mistreated, so I return it back because I think it's justified, and this is what I do. But Jesus' blood is more eloquent and speaks more eloquently than the blood of Abel because it doesn't ask and look for vengeance, but it looks for forgiveness. It looks for healing. Like Rather than this kind of transactional, kind of, okay, legal, like God requires this, we give it, kind of very, very sanitized way of seeing it. No, Jesus says, hold on. Like I, God so loved the world that God took on flesh to show us a more eloquent way of life, that we don't have to live under this big lie of vengeance, but we can love and we can have this power. And there is this blood image that flows. And what Jesus was doing, I believe, in coming and walking around on this earth, the Christ that took on flesh was saying, listen, here's the deal. The blood, the blood of all those who have suffered and died unjustly is still crying out, including the blood of Jesus. And we shouldn't miss that big theme and we have it, I mean, we have it explicitly in Scripture where we have these bright moments where, where we hear God like inspiring people who are saying, I don't want, God doesn't want sacrifice. God doesn't want the shedding of blood. God doesn't need it. 
God doesn't want that. And it, it's breaking in. And the act of the cross, the beauty of it, what makes Good Friday, I've come to be in this space to believe that it's not because I'm such a terrible person and the only way that God could ever allow me in God's presence is if somebody died for me on my behalf. I think the reality, I think that what we see with Jesus is no, the suffering that has existed from the beginning to the end, I'm coming and I will participate in and I will show you how to stop it. I will show you how to stop the violence. And so now we're called to listen to the blood because Jesus shows us just how bad we can be <laughs> when it comes to shedding blood. That we can miss it and we can exclude the God of the universe and we can hang that God on a tree and shed that God's blood in the name of God. And so the blood cries out. Be careful who you exclude. The blood cries out. Be careful who you seek vengeance towards. And so the invitation, I believe, is for our everyday normal lives to listen, to listen, to believe that Abel's blood is crying out in the experiences of others today. That if all suffering is truly connected, if all injustice is connected, that this, that this earth that is soaked with the violence of war and blood the ground itself is continually crying out in the experiences of others today. We talk about it in terms of like this. We say the fear of the other that pervades our world. The fear of the other. What I don't know, what I can't understand, who I don't know, who I can't understand, who I'm told is bad. We have become afraid of that person. And we've talked about a 10-year vision of peacemaking where one of our unacceptable truths is that we will seek to understand that fear, that we will seek to end the fear of other in three primary, primary places, homophobia, racism, and sexism. That the blood of Abel cries out to us in the experiences that come from this fear. And so to do this, to really listen, means that we have to start to have difficult and uncomfortable conversations that if I'm really going to listen to the blood of Abel, if I'm really going to listen to the blood of Jesus that, that points me to the injustice, the unjust way of functioning, the way in which we are so quick to kill what we don't understand, to kill, to murder, to set outside the camp, to say you're not welcome into the temple when we don't understand it, that, that disposition, we have to start having difficult and uncomfortable conversations like God had with Cain, Right? Here's Cain, thinks he's out in the clear, which I don't know how Cain would ever think he'd get away with it. There's only four people on the planet, according to the story. Surely you're going to know when 25% of the world's population is missing. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, like, God comes and he says, he starts to have a very uncomfortable conversation. Where's your brother? Where's your brother? We have to have uncomfortable conversations. What's happened in our world? We have to listen. If we're going to listen, that means we have to actually understand what happened. We can't ignore it anymore. You know, Yahweh says to Cain in this wonderful story, what have you done? What has been done is such a brilliant question for us to ask, to truly listen. Like, what happened? Understanding it. We have this beautiful uh, story that was written by Reverend Sarah Ayer called A Truth That Ricochets about learning to listen to the screams around us. Check this out. I went to a lecture once, uh, an interfaith conversation with interfaith leaders. Whispers bounced off the church's tile floors as people shuffled into place, carrying hope alongside assumptions, mixed into pockets like loose change. About halfway through the evening, a young woman in a blue hijab began speaking. She was the youngest person on the panel, seated far to the left, and you might almost miss her if you weren't paying attention. But not here, not when she spoke. In quiet determination, she told us of fear and persecution. And she told us of hatred and 
racial slurs thrown at her people from car windows like bombs. It was a truth I did not know. It was a truth that ricocheted like sunlight through the cathedral windows, touching almost everyone that day. Then a man in the back, who could have been me, who has been me, approached the microphone and said, your people are persecuted, you live in fear, you're battered by hate. If that is true, then why am I now just hearing about it? Why is your story not on the news? Why have you not spoken up about it? The air was still, partly because we held our breath in anticipation and partly because the spirit slows her dance when we stand at the edge of truth. The woman in the blue hijab leans into the microphone and she whispered with a quiet strength that can only come from years of practice. We are screaming. If there's one truth in my life that unfolds again and again, it is the need to listen. For again and again, I will try with good intentions to act and walk with love, but again and again, I will make mistakes. Again and again, I will say the wrong thing. Again and again, they'll call me Peter, and again and again, they will be right. So again and again, I will pray for a truth that ricochets, for ears that will listen, and for space to hold truth. If people are screaming, and to be clear, people are screaming, I do not want to miss it. I love that line. If people are screaming, and to be clear, they are, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. Here's where it gets really uncomfortable. For whatever reason, we are so afraid to confront the realities of our world. And I'm not sure why that is. I think it's because we have a theology that lends us to be afraid of God. And so we hide. It seems like the pattern. But yet, even in this story of Cain and Abel, like, God protects Cain. And God doesn't see the answer to Cain's mistake, more violence. He actually calls for, God actually calls for vengeance in this story on those that would harm Cain. And he marks Cain to protect Cain from more violence being shed. Yet we miss that in the story. And we just like go on. And even within the text, even within this biblical text, there's like, hey, you know, we're gonna, you know, kill people in the capital, in the death penalty. And it's in the Bible. But you go to the story of Cain at the very beginning. And if there was ever a point in time where you'd go, well, if God wanted the death penalty, there it is. And I know like now I'm waiting in that water that people are like, don't get political. I'm not trying to get political. I'm just like, it's in the Bible. Like if there was ever a moment where the God of the universe who knew exactly what was going on with Cain, who could say this was so unjust, like he could have like vaporized him by the theology that holds to some of these texts, but God doesn't. So the first thing is we have to recognize that God's not afraid of our ignorance. God's not afraid of our mistakes. Love doesn't work that way. But if we're really going to listen to Abel's blood today, We've got to move past our ignorance and our excuses. We have to do it. And this is the part where I get it. Like it gets uncomfortable and I start to get the emails and maybe it's like, oh, I don't know if I want to be a part of a church. It's going to get political. I'm not trying to be. I mean, you just, you can't deal with human life and what the scripture big picture is and how we think about God and not see how it rolls out into the way we parent and, and treat people and take care of the those that are the, the most vulnerable. In our, I mean, it, so we have to move past ignorance, which is just not knowing. And sometimes we need to repent of willful ignorance where we just refuse to imagine that we could be wrong and listen to the other side. I mean, Cain pleaded ignorance in the story, right? Where's, where's Abel? I don't know. I don't know. That's what he says. I don't know. I don't know where Abel is. And then he makes an excuse for not knowing. Am I my brother's keeper? And we continue to make excuses. I mean, let's just be honest, right? My, my belief is that 
we make our excuses that are comfortable for us in these areas of homophobia, sexism, racism. You want to know what that sounds like today, by the way? I never owned slaves. I never owned slaves. I mean, am I my brother's keeper? You know what it sounds like when it comes to sexual minorities? It, within the church, this is what it sounds like. We're all sinners saved by grace. My sin's no different than anybody else's sin. Their sin's no different than mine. Am I my brother's keeper? And that like sentiment excuses the faith, the community of faith from entering into the pain of a sexual minority community that has been abused, that has been, their very personhood has been called sin. And it excuses us from actually listening to the blood that has been shed. And only when we actually listen, only when we say no more ignorance, no more excuses, only when we'll walk into a beautiful gospel, a better way of understanding blood that's not based on sin and sin covering. And, and, and I understand that. And we can have a big conversation and why I don't think it's a bad metaphor that the way it was understood within Paul's framework at times, but why the big picture gives us such a more beautiful gospel. Only when we do that, when we recognize that God is love, that God cares and holds us in our mistakes, that if Cain, who committed the first homicide, could be cared for by God, that we could be cared for by God. And we can own it and understand it and grow from it and learn. And we can stop shedding blood. And we'll all find those ears to hear the blood that cries out and we'll hear the truth that will set us all free. So here's what we're gonna do today. This has been kind of a, a time of reflection. We had a a space in our service for confession. We had a space to just kind of release stress and prepare our hearts. So now we have space to just sit in the reality of this pain. And, and so I hope that you hear God inviting you for the next few moments to just commit to listening to the stories that we want to avoid. That you'll commit to listening to the blood of Jesus that calls us to forgive, to understand ourselves as forgiven, to understand every person as forgiven and loved by God. And so we're going to just take this next few minutes and, and the band's going to play a song and I'm not going to come back out. Nobody's going to come back out and dismiss you. This is just a moment for you to reflect. And I'd ask that you not, don't, like this is not the time if you're at home or in the room to don't finish filling out your connect card during this time. Don't get your offering ready during this time. Just set it all aside for a few minutes. To take some of those things we talked about earlier and breathe in and breathe out and receive the invitation by God to lament and listen, to listen to the blood that cries out. So this song that they're gonna play is kind of a haunting song. It's called Welcome to the Darkness. And I just wanna kind of bring you to one lyric in it that just says, comfort and illusion numb us to the pain. It's like that's why we don't listen to the blood because it's uncomfortable. And we like to build up the illusion that I really have nothing to do with it. Am I my brother's keeper? Like, you know what? All lives matter and we can just, we're just all the same. We're all human beings. We're all created in God's image. It doesn't matter what your sexuality is, but these things do matter because of the injustice that's been taken place based upon them. And so it does, it is important that we recognize it. And it's, it's uncomfortable, I understand that. And in it, we don't see our privilege. And so what do we do? We continue that scapegoat and blaming. And it's a cycle that we don't, I don't think we want to. I just think we do until we pause and listen. So that's the invitation. Lord, open our hearts and our eyes. But today, God, open our ears to the blood of Abel and to the blood of your son, Jesus, that cries out to us again, and again. Welcome to the darkness The fear will let you in The root of all experience 
exclusion Who is out and who is in Systems of belonging Lock us in a Objectify the human with anger, fear, and shame. Damn them with religion and never speak their name. The comfort. Thank you for being here this morning. I want to give you a chance if you want to continue to pray, meditate, stay at your table for a minute. You can do that. We're going to keep playing. And if not, I'll say thank you for being here. And we hope that you have a great week. And we're going to see you next week.